Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is uh, the BioCell webinar number 36. Uh, today's webinar is going to be about prediction of protein-protein interactions in Capri. Uh, our presenters will be Shoshana Vodak from the Rijn Universiteit Brussel and Mark Lensing from the Université de Lille. Uh, I'm your host uh, on behalf of the BioCell Center of Excellence, Arno Kuma at the University of Edinburgh. Before I hand over to our speaker, our speakers, I first want to give you a little introduction about BioXL. Uh, BioXL, the center of excellence, um, is aimed at improving uh, the performance, efficiency, and scalability of key applications that are of interest to life science researchers. Um, the applications that we have in the project we're focusing on include Chromax, CP2K, Haddock. We're also interested in workflows to improve the usability um, of these applications and associated pipelines. Uh, and we are developing workflows, including um, incorporating work for the common workflow language and Compass S, uh, as well as these activities surrounding the development uh, and improvement of usability of applications. We are also uh, providing training um, and in-depth support and consultancy uh, to help promote best practice and to train end users in the optimal use of the um, applications and workflow tools. So with regards to today's session and today's presenters, uh, we have Shoshana Vodak, um, who is a uh, visiting group leader currently at uh, the VUB, VUB Structural Biology Research Center at the Vrije Universiteit Brussels. Um, so, uh, so Shana was scientific director of the protein engineering team at the Plant and Egg Systems in Belgium. Uh, she co-directed the Center for Structural Biology and Bioinformatics um, and has been a member of EMBO, um, as well as serving on numerous panels and advisory committees for uh, Horizon 2020, including Horizon 2020 in the US and Canada. Uh, she is serving on the management committee of CAPRI, which is uh, Primary, primary interest for the uh, for today's session. So as well as Shoshana, we have uh, Mark, who will mostly be um, answering questions at the end, helping answer questions at the end. So Mark uh, is based at the Université de Lille. He's also in the management committee of uh, Capri. Uh, he is a team leader of the Computational Molecular Systems Biology Group um, at the Institute for Structural and Functional Microbiology. So um, finally, uh, just to give a little idea of the kind of the partners that are included in the BioXL Center of Excellence, includes uh, a number of uh, universities, research institutes, consultancies uh, throughout uh, the European Union. So I will now hand over to Shoshana uh, to start her presentation. So hello everybody. So I'm going to uh, give the presentation on Capri and on the history of Capri and hopefully you know on what we expect in the future for this important endeavor. So just a short introduction. It's about protein-protein interactions. That's what Capri is about and uh, this is not a new area of research. It has been around for 40 years. We have been studying protein-protein interactions at the molecular level using information from uh, protein structures and dynamics. And uh, we have also been more recently studying protein interactions on the cellular level, mostly on the genome scale on protein, who, which proteins interact with which other partners and these I'm showing these, you know, big hairballs of networks. So we have been analyzing this on, on both sides, on the molecular and cellular level, yet many, many questions remain unanswered. So I'm going to uh, give you the presentation and that's the, you know, the plan of, of what, what I'm going to cover. I'm going to cover some fundamental principles of protein-protein interactions. What we have learned from X-ray structures about protein-protein interfaces, which is important to understand this in order to know what we are doing. 
and I'm going to give you a background uh, and more recent aspects of protein-protein docking, which I call then and now. And uh, the rest of the talk is uh, going to uh, uh, deal with CAPRI critical assessment of predicted interactions. So protein-protein interactions, some of fundamental principles that everybody needs to know in order to be able to do anything to think about protein, uh, protein interaction, then to develop software, and so, et cetera. So binding affinities and rates. So genome-wide studies answer by yes or no the question, do protein A and B form a complex? Yet protein-protein interactions are dynamic and they are subject to the law of mass action. So that's what this slide explains, you know, A plus B, forms a comp protein A plus protein B forms a complex, you have a forward uh, uh, kinetic constant and association constant and a dissociation, const a dissociation uh, rate constant, and you have the equilibrium constant, which is the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the ratio of the two. But a very important quantity is the equilibrium constant and the Gibbs free energy, which is the uh, logarithm of the equilibrium constant, and it depends also on the standard state. So the uh, equilibrium constant and the Gibbs free energy are very important, are the quantities that determine the association. In other words, the values of these quantities determine whether a complex is formed given the component concentrations. So that's very, very key that it's in the formation of a complex is concentration dependent. And that has to do with crystallography where, you know, crystallization is formed at very, very high uh, concentrations of components usually, and NMR as well. So the dynamic times, the dynamics and time scales of complex formation, they are governed by the rate constants, uh, the association rate constant, the bimolecular one, and the dissociation rate constant, which is monomolecular. In the lifetimes, you know, it takes the, the, the lifetime, the, the, the time it takes to form a complex and the lifetime of the complex, I show, you know, what it depends on. The time it, ta it takes to form a complex is inversely proportional to the concentration of, uh, of, of uh, the uh, reactant, but uh, inversely also propor proportional to the association rate constant. And the uh, lifetime is uh, inversely proportional to the dissociation rate constant. So this is, these are really important quantities to understand and to, to keep in mind. Now, protein-protein interactions in the cell, you know, uh, they span a very wide range of binding affinities and lifetimes. And this is, you know, this is a, 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 a table that has been uh, put together by Joël Janin a number of years ago, which is really important. And it shows you the time scales and the uh, association constant scales ranges, you know, from one molar to one picomolar. And, you know, it kind of positions uh, the different complexes you find in the cell, starting from, from you know, oligomeric complexes on the right-hand side, where the, the association constants are really uh, important. The association constants are very small, and the association constants are high, and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the lifetimes of the complexes are really high on the on days, goes from days on the right to microseconds on the left. So you see the uh, specific interactions in the cell and uh, are or more towards the right hand side and the non-specific interactions are those which are you know have weak association constants and 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 uh, are very uh, very short-lived so this is again important to keep in mind now what we have learned from analyzing uh, protein structures in the pdb these are studies that have been done a while ago, and it's still they still hold and kind of direct our thinking of what you know what what the association, what the interfaces of these protein protein complexes tell us. So it's really important. This is the graph that shows you the interface area of protein complexes, a small number of protein now you know considered as a small number of protein complexes 
which have been analyzed in the PDB. And why surface area? Surface area is important because be the buried area is one of the major driving forces that uh, bring two proteins together. So just the area itself, which is proportional more or less to the hydrophobic contribution to the uh, Gibbs free energy uh, of association, is, is actually proportional to the interface area. So here is a, a an analysis of, of known protein complexes, which you know shows you, it tells you, for example, in where the antibody antigen complexes come, and this is you know in, in the middle here uh, towards the surface buried surface area of a thousand seven hundred angstrom squared, and then you have the protease inhibitors which span a wider wider range. So this analysis allowed at the time to determine what a standard kind of standard interface or recognition module would be. And uh, the standard interface for, for true, for actually biologically relevant complexes is about 1,600 angstrom squared. And it has a good number of hydrogen bonds and you know, the contact, the, 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 the contacts, the, the interface comprises about you know 24 amino acids and you know the interface atoms they have so many buried atoms etc so it really gives you a picture of what a, a recognition module would be now other studies have also also shown that interfaces uh, between proteins either you know between homo homo dimers or hetero hetero complexes uh, uh, they are they comprise you know somewhat different uh, somewhat different contributions of the residues of the interface to the interaction in other words if you take apart the kind of open up the interface and you're looking at the surface that actually interacts with the other subunit which i show here on the left hand side you see a region in red which is the core of the interface and it comprises residues which contain at least one fully buried interface atom. And then you have in blue the rim residues, and these are uh, uh, residues where all the atoms remain accessible to some point, at, at, at some level, to solvent. And the properties of these residues are somewhat different, and analysis of the properties of the core residues, which has been done much, much more recently, in 2012 by Levy and Teichmann showed that the amino acid compositions in these core residues is actually quite different from the surface. And you have here this, what they call a stickiness scale. And that's quite interesting because that can be used to kind of recognize interfaces in, to, to some level. So for example, it shows you here that an arginine is actually quite well accepted in, in, in the core of the interface. Whereas, you know, the uh, less sticky amino acids are, are lysine and the most sticky amino acids are phenylalanine, isoleucine or cysteine. So you can see that. So this is what we learned. And uh, another interesting study, which is very relevant to Capri, is that it is uh, not clear to single out, not easy to single out specific interfaces, those which correspond to biologically relevant complexes, from non-specific interactions. And as example of non-specific interactions, the studies that I, that I list here on the bottom uh, took uh, the interfaces in crystal structures because these interfaces form, they are not biologic, they have not been selected by, by nature. They form because you, know, you increase the concentrations and there are many contacts that form the crystal. So, the, the study that was uh, undertaken at the time was to compare the surface areas uh, and the packing, so and actually the surface areas, the buried areas in true complexes, in biologically rele relevant complexes, with those found in crystal interfaces. And this is the graph that is uh, presented here. So the bar graph is the interfaces of two of, of biologically relevant complexes that I showed uh, a little bit before, where you see that you know the peak of, of this bar graph is around 1,600 angstrom squared that you know was the interaction module 
that I highlighted before, and uh, much smaller interfaces, a, a gr the green peak is uh, the green graph peaks at much smaller values at buried interfaces of around 600 angstrom squared, and those are the small interfaces that you find in the crystal. So the true biological uh, uh, interfaces are much larger than crystal interfaces, except that you know you have sometimes an overlap between these two distributions, which is shown also here. So the larger interfaces in crystal contacts are mainly associated with twofold symmetry axes, and sometimes they correspond to true interfaces, and sometimes no. So that's part of the of, of a problem of of identifying. Uh, uh, from crystal structures, the true interfaces from the non the specific ones from the non specific ones, and this problem is actually currently not really solved, and this is what I present in this slide. So how does one identify the biological unit from crystal structures and uh, this you know some computational procedures are available to do this, and two that I list here are PISA a computational procedure which evaluates the chemical and structural properties of interfaces in the crystal and you know kind of looks for interfaces which are more uh, uh, more more likely to be you know stable interfaces of complexes and and based and and identifies this biological unit based on that and the other procedure is called EPIC, and it, use, it uses mostly geometric measures and sequence conservation to also identify interfaces that have been selected by evolution rather than just haphazardly by the crystallization procedure. And a more recent approach is QS align, which is actually a procedure that really relies on uh, predicting if you have a new crystal. And you have an interface. I'm sorry, I have I have a if uh, you have a crystal and you want to identify the uh, biological interface, you uh, actually rely on the information that is already available in the PDB on related structures and related quaternary arrangements of structures. So you do global superimpositions, global alignments of your interface or your, you know, the biological unit that you think is in the crystal, you align it to what exists in the, in the PDB and you try to see whether the same quaternary arrangement is found in related structures and this is how you decide whether your predicted, your biological unit is reasonable or not. So, you know, that's also something which is published, but, you know, it's very helpful and it helped recently to uh, to reassign more correctly 95% of the assemblies in the PDB. Anyway, so this is kind of a background of what kind of challenges you need to, you know, you're facing when you want to predict or model protein-protein interaction. So what about protein-protein docking and this is, I would like to give a short history and then, you know, what, where we are at now. So protein-protein docking, what is it? It has been derived, has been defined at the time and still is defined today, but, you know, more loosely. It's to derive the atomic model of a protein assembly from the three-dimensional coordinates of the components. In other words, you need to know the components and these components in principle exist, you know, are stable on their own, but if they are available in high enough concentrations or even, you know, if they, they can interact with high enough affinity, you know, there is a particular, a particular orientation and position or particular interface that they form and that is biologically relevant. So this is what I show here. So docking is to find out which which interface, which part of the receptor on the on the left hand side and the ligand on the right hand side, which part will really recognize each other and form a stable association. So as I say on the bottom, it applies to assemblies for which the individual component exists in free form. So as defined and still 
still today, the challenges of protein-protein docking, I mean, it has two important components. Uh, one is efficient sampling of rigid body degrees of freedom and alternative confirmations that the subunits can adopt upon association. That's very key. And the other key component is to identify from all these sampled, you know, uh, sampled uh, poses, identify the stable association modes. And since you sample many poses, so you need to identify stable association modes from a very large ensemble of docking solutions. So you need for that, to be able to do that, you need to find, you know, the needle from the haystack. So you need robust and reliable scoring functions, scoring or energy functions that will tell you whether, you know, a particular association mode is really likely to be stable. So protein protein docking really started a while ago, and this is these are the people who have been very influential. Was you know Cyrus Leventhal is the uh, uh, father of of the folding paradox, protein folding paradox, but he was interested in protein docking as well, and uh, he taught me a lot. So he was my my PhD advisor at the time, and I worked together for many years with Joel Jana in Paris. And the docking, actually, the first docking calculations were done at the CCAM workshop, work, workshop of 1976, where also the molecular dynamics, the first molecular dynamics simulations were carried out. Everybody was doing molecular dynamics, and I was doing docking. So the first docking calculations were done at Columbia University with very, very old, at the time, very powerful computing. Uh, uh, computers, very huge, you know, three, IBM 36091s, and uh, very, you know, uh, today's standards, very, very basic graphics. But this is how it all started. So that was, we used a computer program that was developed by the lab of Cyrus Levent. I was the only one at the time together with another, you know, another important effort at Princeton. So, the very first docking that, that were carried out, I think, were uh, in the lab uh, docking a small molecule, a dinucleotide, into the uh, uh, enzyme, into the active site of the enzyme RNAs S. And, you know, it had, we had to do this because we couldn't see really the phosphate that was uh, the phosphate position of the CPA because it was a changing with the sulfate uh, when uh, the crystal was prepared, it was being prepared. So we had to derive, you know, a, a docking procedure, but uh, the docking programs worked only on internal degrees of freedom, in other words, on phi psi angles and uh, uh, chi angles. So we had to, you know, we had to figure out a very, you know, pseudo atoms that were positioned at particular positions in space so that a translation was actually a rotation where the axis of rotation was very far away. So we had, this is what we had to do, but it worked very well and we managed to do, you know, to rotate, to, to change the rigid body positions and also the, the angles of the, of the dinucleotide as well as side chain. So that's the first, you know, kind of uh, flexible docking that was uh, done. Now, because we started this, this was really exciting. Then, you know, we tried to, you know, we, we, we transferred this, we extended this to protein, protein docking using polar coordinates. So we were interested in, in docking two hemoglobin molecules to one another in order to build a hemoglobin fiber. And so the, uh, uh, the docking calculations at the time were uh, carried out as a function of six degrees of freedom. We had two Eulerian angles uh, for one molecule that, that you show, like, showed like a sphere on the, on the left-hand side, Eulerian angles for the second molecule. And as you move these angles, you, you change the relative positions of the two spheres. And then you had a spin that you kind of turned around the axis uh, that links the two centers. 
and you had to, you know, uh, you had to uh, uh, sample the distances, and this is shown at the, on the right hand side. You had to optimize the interaction in 1D along this uh, inter intersphere distance. And for the protein, at the time, the computations were taking very, very long time. So we had to use a very simplified model where there was one interaction residue, one interaction center per residue, and that was the model that was just just at the time derived by Michael Levitt. So we used the uh, simplified interaction center and we took uh, a, a, uh, uh, a term that was a repulsive term shown you know, at the E non-bonded here. You have a repulsive term, which is to the uh, Rij0 divided by Rij to the, to the, uh, to the uh, power of eight. And then a very, a very uh, simple uh, solvation energy that also allowed us to evaluate the buried area. So with this very simple model, we applied it to dock for the first time, very first time to dock the BPTI, the uh, bovine uh, uh, trypsin uh, uh, inhibitor, uh, to trypsin. So uh, we actually, uh, we, we sampled the entire surface of the BPTI, but we limited the search region to the active site of the trypsin. And uh, on the left-hand side, you see a bar graph of the surface and buried surface area as we were docking different parts of the BPTI into the active site of trypsin. And the energy, I, it's kind of, you know, it's not really the energy, it's actually the buried area. And uh, the native, you see the buried area of the native is the highest. And then you have two other, you know, two other poses of the BPTI relative to, to the trypsin, where the surface area, buried surface area is also high. This, you know, the a position I, kind of an intermediate I1 and I2. And when you look at the BPTI surface, which is on the, just on the, on the lower right hand side, you see that there are a number of uh, surface regions, which I, I, I highlight in blue, that actually give very nice buried surface areas with the active site of trypsin. And the only reason for that is that, you know, the complementarity of the surface complementarity is, is not so good, but it's better than everything else. And it's not exactly, at, not as good as the native, but it still really, you know, fits more or less. So what you are seeing here on the on the bar graph is the landscape of possible, you know, and an energy landscape of the interaction. And that was the first time that such a landscape was, you know, was 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 produced. So anyway, this was a long time ago, and for a while, no, no one was interested in protein-protein interactions. But years later, you know, things started to, you know, move again. And nowadays, in more recent years, the modeling of three-dimensional structures and protein assemblies have been more and more integrated. And uh, oh, so, you know, it. Nowadays, it involves much more, you know, template-based modeling at several levels, docking, confirmation of sampling, scoring, and it is supported by a vibrant community of methods developers, and uh, these developments have been really stimulated by Capri and by CASC, and I will talk about that a bit more. But anyway, just to show you kind of the, ev the evolution of the whole field, Protein, protein docking, as I just described it, used to be, and even when we started Capri, and this will come in a moment, we had to start from the unbound structures of the two components, because the idea is these structures need to be, you know, you need to know what the three dimensional structures of, of, of the proteins of the components are, and then you do the docking, and this is what, you know, this was what, what I just showed you and what it was for a, for a number of years. Later on, as we got, you know, more, as the PDB got populated more and more, we got more and more examples of homologs, which had this a similar structure to the structures that you wanted, you know, to model. And hence, we started, you know, what we call today template-based modeling, 
of individual subunits. In other words, you didn't need to provide, to, to model the complex, you didn't need to know the unbound structure. You just needed to know the sequence, and then you could go search the PDB for homologs and build a homology model of your components and then dock these components to each other. That's much, very much what is still done today if, you know, in, in, in many, many circumstances. And even later, you know, what, as, as the PDB beca became more and more uh, populated with complexes, but this, you know, has never really caught up with individual subunits, you could also have cases in which your, the complex that you want to, uh, to model has homologs of the entire complex in the PDB. And hence, you could actually model the interface as well, you know, as, as in the, the individual subunit. So this is kind of template-based modeling of complexes. And even later on more of what, what, what happens today is that, you know, all this together, you combine all these approaches into what you know you probably know well in in uh, uh, in bioexcel is an integrative modeling of large protein assemblies or integrative modeling of of more complex biological uh, uh, biological components so it's combining different things comparative modeling this homology based modeling with docking fitting combining the docking, you know, using also proteomics data, using uh, and density maps from, from uh, uh, electron microscopy, and, you know, building these, you know, much more complex assemblies. So this is, you know, how everything is coming together. Now, this is the picture in which we kind of operate nowadays in Capri, but now let me talk to you and let me now go into Capri and how Capri and CASP have contributed to all this. So CASP, critical assessment of structure prediction, and Capri, the critical assessment of predicted interactions, you know, both play the very, very crucial role in fostering progress, kind of the progress that I just kind of summarized in the field, and also they were very important to build the communities. So what about, this is, you know, uh, going more deeply into Capri. So Capri is a community-wide double-blind experiment. It was modeled after CASP and it was launched in 2001, so a while ago, but after CASP. So it was really modeled after CASP. So it aims at assessing the performance of protein docking and scoring algorithms, but now we can say that it's performance of predicting, you know, protein assemblies. So it's about the prediction of the structure of an unpublished protein-protein complex, protein DNA or RNA complex. Depending the number of components, you can have, you know, two or more components, also of protein peptide complexes. And it has also been occasionally extended to the prediction of binding affinity and interface water prediction, as well as in, I'll show you the prediction of just interfaces. So the Capri Management Committee is listed here. And, you know, Joel Jana was, you know, directing Capri a while ago. He, I think, uh, left Capri uh, around 2013. So these are the people currently involved and really uh, contributing to running running the uh, uh, running the challenge. So uh, the prediction of what is special in Capri, which differs from CAS, is that the, predict the prediction rounds are held on a rolling basis. So the typical number of predictors is smaller than CAS. It's about 30, 40 per round, which is already high. We have a number of docking servers that are participating, sometimes 15, sometimes more, and that was in 2018. And the number, total number of rounds was, that, that was held is 47, and the number of targets to date is 162. It's much less than CAS, but you know, because of the paucity in general of complexes of targets that we can get, we can get. but hopefully this is going to change. 
Now, what is what is the this Capri experiment? We call it still a docking experiment, even though, as you you heard, you know, it sometimes it's more template-based modeling than docking. So the crystallographers, the structural biologists, now you know, electron microscopists also, they submit the atomic coordinates for a target complex before it's published. And again, as I said, it's an ongoing basis, on a rolling basis. Whenever a target becomes available, whenever someone you know has something interesting that they can offer, but we are we are soliciting soliciting these targets. The predictors are provided with the sequences of the protein subunits and asked to return 100 models of the complex. But they only need to rank in terms of you know, what they think are the best models. Only five of them have to be ranked. Previously, or a long time ago, only unbound structures were provided. Now, no, we only provide sequences. The assessors, and this you know, assessing team has been uh, for always the same team of assessors and uh, oh, that's also different from CASP. So they are given the three-dimensional structures of the target in confidence and all the structures of predicted models and they have to establish the correspondence between the target and the model using established uh, quality assessment criteria and this is very very important. I'll, I'll, I'll show you these criteria in a moment or summarize them. The identity of the predictors is with help from the assessors and the performance of a particular group is based or uh, is ranked on the basis of the five best predicted models. Now, a number of years ago already, we added a scoring experiment. As you remember, I said in the beginning of the talk that you know docking has two components, the sampling and the scoring. So some people are really good at, at sampling. And some, you know, some groups are much better at scoring. So we decided to allow people to score models based on the submitted models of of others. So in the in the prediction round, you know, people submit when there is a deadline for submitting predicted models, and after all the models have all the hundred models are, are submitted, then you know we offer these models to scorers to extract from those or to identify from those models which are likely to be correct. So the predictors submit their 100 models and it's often you know, totaling about 3,000 models per target on average. The Capri management shuffles and combines all these models while keeping track of the origins and predictors are given access to the shuffled set and asked to return five best models and the assessors evaluate the models in the classical experiment. So these two experiments you know are really run in run you know one after the scoring experiment after the after the uh, predicting one. So we also had like three now CASP Capri assembly prediction rounds and these are from in, two, in 214, 216 and 218. One was very recent with a large number of targets. And these, these uh, uh, prediction rounds are run over a, a period of about one month, one and a half months during the summer. And it's quite, quite tight schedule for the predictions. So anyway, overall, you know, we had critical assessment of predicted interaction uh, uh, meetings. And we have a number of special issues of proteins, you know, describing, describing the uh, results. So to date, as I said, 47 prediction rounds, 100, 162 targets, and the results were presented at seven evaluation meetings with the seventh one was just held in April at the EBI. So the CAPI assessment protocols, you know, is, is kind of a science in itself, okay? So it's not very easy not completely straightforward to say whether you know how good the prediction is it was always not not straightforward even for protein structure predictions but for the complexes it, it's it's also complicated so this is you know a summary of of what we have done of course if you have questions and it has been published so you will you will find the answer so it has like uh, uh, 
for, first of all, you have to define the residues present in all the all the uh, uh, predictive models. So you have to align the sequences in the models to the target. You have to reject models where the sequence differ too much. Then you have, you know, you're using some rough estimates. This is not, I'm not giving you exactly the protocol how it's run. I'm just, you know, kind of summarizing what we, what, what we are looking at. So then you have, you, you, you evaluate the rough estimate of the accuracy of the three dimensional structure. It's like backbone RMSD of the model versus the target, you know, the different subunits usually. And for, you know, for evaluating the actual complex, you, uh, these are the, the standard Capri protocol evaluation. So you evaluate multiple interfaces in the, you know, in the complex and in the target. So uh, for each interface, you are, let's say, on the right hand side, you have the target, you count the number of residue residue contacts, you know, defined in a certain way the number of ligand interface residues and the number of receptor interface residues. And, you know, also you need to define the interface in a particular way. Knowing this, you then compare, you know, you then superimpose the receptors of the models to those of the interface, of the, of the, uh, uh, of the target. And then, you know, you evaluate the position of the ligand relative to the uh, superimposed receptor and this gives you an idea of the displacement of the ligand, uh, ligand component, the angular displacement and the distance which I'm showing, you know, the DL and, and theta L and uh, uh, you also evaluate uh, after, you know, you, you evaluate the um, number of native contacts, the recalled the number of recalled native contacts, and the number of additional contacts which are not native. And we also evaluate the actual uh, uh, root mean square deviation of the interface residues themselves. So these are the various quantities that you evaluate. And then you, uh, yeah, what I wanted just, this, this, this slide is also just to illustrate that you need to, if you have a certain, you know, a certain assembly that is predicted, you look at, you look at the individual interfaces and you look at the overlap of individual interfaces in the model to interfaces in the target. And you look, you, you, you select, right now you select the best predicted interfaces. So, we are not completely happy with this protocol yet, but you know we need to find something better to evaluate the full assembly relative to the full assembly of the target, which is still an, an open problem. Now, in doing all this, in evaluating the assemblies, you know the the, the assembly of the target, uh, uh, assembly, the assembly in the predicted model relative to the assembly of the target. Sometimes it's not obvious what the assembly of the target really is. So uh, in some cases, to really find what, what is the biological unit of the target, in other words, a problem that I just mentioned before. So sometimes, you know, the assessors have to go back to the crystal contact to find some answers. So one example on, on, the, on the left hand side is that we have, we have a complex in the crystal where the membrane localization domains are actually interacting with each other in the crystal. That's in A. When you go to B, it's another, it, it, it's, it's another set of contacts from the crystal structure that have been, have been identified by the assessor that see that these membrane uh, localization domains it's a, it's a different interface and they position the membrane localization domains in a parallel orientation, which seems to be kind of fitting into a membrane. So, which which asset, which uh, mode in you know which which biological unit is correct is not known, but at least this is something that we have to look at. And on the right hand side, C and D, you have a similar situation where you know you have a a dimer of a of, of, of similar subunits and you have two diff, two smaller subunits interacting on both sides of a particular dimer interface 
But if you look at the crystal, you find a much more globular arrangement where the two, you know, the the turquoise and the uh, and the uh, uh, yellow uh, subunits really interact with each other. So it is, you know, it's not completely straightforward. Anyway, Capri evaluation, the scoring and ranking of models, we. You know what what Capri has been doing over the years is being very you know lenient in 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 defining just using ranges in in terms of how good the interface is rather than than you know quali quantitatively you know really having a continuous measure so you know for high the score you have a good interface where the number of recalled native contacts is at least fifty percent. And the ligand RMSD is smaller or smaller than one angstrom, or the interface RMSD is smaller than one angstrom. And you know, and acceptable interfaces are actually, you know, interfaces where the recall of the native contact of the interface is more, is, is, is at least 10%, which is not very much. And the RMSD of the ligand can be between five and ten, and the iron RMS can be between two and four. So uh, also models with too many clashes are, are not considered. But more recently, we have been looking into a more continuous you know, a score, where, which is a function of these different quantities, because these different quantities have been very useful. But you know, sometimes it's, you know, if you use thresholds like that, you, know, you are not always being very fair to people. So this is something we have been looking at recently, and this is published, I forgot to put in the, the reference. So many targets, we had you know, these, a, a number of targets. The targets in Capri have evolved a lot. They, you know, they were you know, more easier targets you know, in, the, in the early days, and more specific types of complexes in the early days. And they have evolved. And you see on, on, on the left hand side, you see some examples. And on the later target, actually, what, what we are showing is every time, you know, a, as a reference, this the so called receptor. And then you see a cloud of, of points which are the center of mass of the uh, ligand that has been predicted by all the groups taken together. And then maybe you can see a little bit of green, a little bit of red. This is where the actual correct position of the center of mass of the uh, target is. So sometimes, you know, you see in some cases the predictions are pretty good around this region of, of, of uh, uh, around the red point, but there always are, you know, many kind of decoys or, or incorrect poses around it. And oh, sorry. And uh, uh, recently, you know, some, some success stories and some failures, you know, in, in, in this case, uh, uh, this target 95 was an uh, interesting complex with a nucleosome that has been correctly predicted. You see the complex is positioned here near the region where you see a little red and a little turquoise, and this was a successfully predicted complex. And the other cases where complexes, where you see, for example, this uh, target 96, 97, you see a red, you know, receptor and uh, two positions. Uh, one was, you know, of, of the of the of the ligands. One is the correct one, and one is the one the best predicted one, which was the don't overlap. And uh, in the target 99 and target 100 are cases, interesting cases of ternary complexes, which uh, where the the red, you know, the red subunits adopts a number of conformations depending on what the other complex, what the other subunit, what, what the interaction partner is. And these changes are very difficult to, to predict and usually people fail to do so. So we had overall targets, you know, these are the evolution of targets, which is not really very crucial, but you know, it has evolved quite quite a bit. The number of targets have evolved quite a bit in recent years. So what what have we seen during these years? So we have seen that docking has become a very field, very active field of research. 
and many new groups are regularly you know, group, new groups are regularly entering the field groups from china from japan you know from other other regions you know from eastern europe as well now the performance of docking methods had remained quite robust despite the increasing complexity of the, of the target so the 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 variety of the targets has increased the the size of the assemblies that have to be that, that are offered this target has has increased and yet you know the docking methods have have you know systematically it's hard to say if they have improved you know as such i mean definitely you can say that that they have been able to meet the, ch the challenges as they come the scoring functions have improved as per copy scoring experiment that we have seen and uh, what is really interesting and it actually you know tells us tells that the progress hasn't has been achieved is that the performance of automatic docking servers has much much improved and this is fostering a wider use of docking algorithms by the scientific community and this has been quite remarkable so that was written a, maybe two years ago nowadays you have many more servers and about four or five servers are really quite you know quite reliable and they perform nearly on par with human predictions uh, human predictors in copper so this is i just show a number one or two slides on 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 some recent results on cusp capri prediction performance here you see each you know each column here represents the performance based on this continuous score which is called the docs q score on particular interfaces of targets so we are still evaluating targets based on 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 the i mean how how good the interface is and the colors here are based on the capri criteria red is high quality complexes high quality prediction green is medium quality prediction uh, uh, blue is 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 acceptable and yellow is incorrect so we have a number for easy targets those you know that can be readily modeled using you know sequence information those the predictions are really quite good so this gives you an idea of what the performance is you know when you have enough information on ho on homologs and not necessarily and sometimes even on complexes but for difficult targets where you know little information is available for the individual components let alone the complex then it really depends for some parts some of these more difficult targets are are assemblies you know where you have more than one interface and some interfaces in these assemblies are predicted better than others and these are the you know the red red bars and the in the green bars that you see so this is kind of an overview you know over a limited number of about 20 targets and like 14 something interfaces recent and you know that's also this is uh, results for the same interfaces but just measuring how well the individual subunits have been predicted in terms of the three-dimensional structure of the subunit and that's the the molecular root mean square deviation of the backbone and you see for the easy targets these deviations are really low and for the difficult targets you see that some components are probably you know very poorly modeled and hence this influences the result for modeling of the of the assembly so we also as i said you know in in capri you know we have been extending you know the scope of what we look at what we do in capri so one uh, as one analysis that we did and we did it again this year is the prediction of actual interface residues not of the contacts how well the contacts of the given interface are predicted but how docking how the modeling and docking uh, uh, that that was done by predictors how well are the actual residues of the interface predicted and we find that you know many of the incorrect models based on the capri criteria actually correspond to reasonably correct interface in other words you predict the region of the protein that interacts, but you don't predict the exact relative position of the two components uh, correctly. So the prediction of interfaces 
of, of interface residue seems to be uh, uh, easier than the prediction of, of contact, although that's not always, you know, not always true. But at least this was the result that we got a while ago. Now we also went into, in some cases, the complexes, the targets that were provided. Uh, questions by the authors were, can you predict the interface water molecule positions? And this is something that we asked the predictors to do, and they, you know, derived uh, potential positions or, 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 you know, inferred position of water molecules, and then we compared these positions to the actual positions in the interfaces. And this, these were interesting complex, where certain complexes had a, a number of homologues in the PDB that the authors knew, and they knew which water positions were conserved in these complexes. And these were the water positions that the predictors were much more successfully predicting. And another area that, that, that uh, uh, knew quite a bit of development recently is the predicting of protein peptide complexes. And here you see an example of a very nice prediction of a peptide, which was actually very, very nicely positioned relative to the complex in the, in the target. Okay, so uh, just a quick, <laughs> A quick uh, uh, summary because everything really depends on the on, on the on, on the methods, and this was something that we discuss a lot in Capri meetings, and that people discuss in the Capri community, exchange a lot, you know, information on, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, the generation of models, you know, uh, of course, you 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 can use homology modeling. Uh, you have to use homology modeling. Sometimes you use in-house procedures. Sometimes you use, you know, public servers like Modelers and Swiss Model. And in CASP, in, in, in common CASP experiments, you used, you know, people use models or it's submitted by the CASP community during the CASP round. Then, you know, template-based mod modeling and uh, 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 these template-based modeling are used increasingly for homo oligomers. In other words, you find much more commonly templates for, for you know, homo dimers and homo trimers than you found for hetero complexes. And then, of course, you need to do, to do ab initio docking in, you know, in cases where you don't find templates. And there, you know, you have a number of methods that vary depending on, you know, on, 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 on the groups, you know, fast rigid body sampling, followed by refinement with confirmation of flexibility, data-driven docking, integrating functional biochemical and biophysical information. That's something that Haddock is using a lot and now other, other, other groups as well. And then you have a whole panoply of scoring functions with all type of, of of, of components, of terms in the function, shape complementarity, ge geometric hashing, uh, geometric uh, matching, or geometric hashing also, van der Waals potentials, electrostatics, hydrophobic potential, solvation. Some of them, you know, are similar, but just called differently by people. And then you have hydrogen bonding potential, experimental restraints, as I, you know, just mentioned a bit as well. Rotomer probabilities, Voronoi volumes, and some machine learning, also, although not really recent. Anyway, the methods, what is important is that because, you know, CAPI has expanded into different areas, so the methods uh, uh, were adapted to handle diverse types of complexes, such as protein peptide, protein RNA, DNA, protein oligosaccharides, and so on. And, you know, as these new targets are being offered, people, you know, really amend their methods, and that has been a, a motor for progress in the field. So, uh, that's, you know, kind of Capri. And now, uh, a few slides on, on, on where we are going. Now, uh, not long ago, together with, uh, uh, with bon, uh, uh, Alexander Bonvin and, and, and the Capri community as a whole, we established, uh, we opened a, a, a web resource, which is called capri.docking.org. And this is a portal and GitHub for assembly modeling software 
uh, that is being developed by the Capri community. And it's not only software, and it's, it's also benchmark uh, data sets and, and, and docking servers and, and, and all this. So this, you know, you can have a look and you see what, what we offer there. And this is also a portal for communication with the community at large. No, and, and it's just the beginning, so it's not here for a long time, but you know, it's, it's being developed. So one, as I mentioned, the important, uh, any important development is the performance, I mean, in the docking servers and in, in uh, uh, copy.docking, you can find the performance of these servers as, it, you know, as, as, as our challenges uh, evolve. And that's really important if you want to know, you know, which server, actually the idea is to tell people which server is better at what, but you know, for the time being, these are the servers that really perform well in, you know, in Capri. Now, so where are we at? So uh, what we know, you know, across the years and especially, you know, more recently is what we can say is that the binding free energies is still not, you know, not, not, not performing, you know, not performing optimally. So these are the force field scoring function, conformational sampling, positive or reliable, you know, structure affinity benchmarks. All this, you know, needs to be, you know, improved. In other words, the force field themselves, the scoring function, the conformational sampling is also important because free energies, you know, you need sampling for that. And what you also need uh, very crucially is reliable structure affinity data benchmarks because this is, you know, this is what helps you to improve your, you know, your computational procedures. So all this is still, you know, still not op optimal. And uh, we still cannot uh, uh, or, or hardly uh, discriminate binders from non-binders. And hence, you know, evaluating the specificity, what, you know, what, what is a specific binding mode is still remains elusive. And an important, a very important uh, uh, shortcoming still is the poor ability to model conformational changes. And this is something that, you know, I will bring up. So to some extent, data-driven modeling procedures overcome some of these limitations, but uh, not always. So uh, another aspect that you know we have been also kind of uh, uh, discussing and and, and 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 aiming towards is what I out, uh, outlined here in on the kind of pink background. So you need to consider the system, not just the building blocks. In other words, you need to better integrate three-dimensional structure, the prediction of the, of the 3D structure of the protein and component and the assembly modeling, something which actually CASP doesn't do, and we don't do it. Capri doesn't do it, you know, really optimally either. And finally, you know, what I think is crucial also is to integrate the dynamic component, better modeling of local and global conformational flexibility using both computational and bioinformatic tools. So to try to address all these, you know, things also, we have been discussing how to go forward with this, you know, in the framework of Elixir and the, and the uh, formation of 3D bioinfo community of Elixir. How does Capri contribute to this? And how can Capri be integrated in a, in a larger effort? So I'm not going to go in all these details, but you know, on the right hand side, you see, you know, some, you know, I talk about we talk about benchmark data sets and knowledge portal. And these are aspects that you know we would like to develop, you know, together with other partners. And to be more precise, I mentioned here this could be a potential collaboration with BioExcel. So no, we would like to develop a knowledge portal for tools for modeling protein flexibility that would be useful for, uh, for, for docking. In other words, can you predict likely moves and moving parts of you know, components? Can, you, you know, can we model confirmation ensemble somehow and then use them to dock? And 
maybe there could be multi-scale docking, docking where these things, you know, represent the protein at different, different, you know, resolution levels and do, you know, do something that will help to move forward into a uh, uh, model deconformation chain. But, you know, what we also need is benchmark data sets to evaluate methods for building, scoring, and ranking models of protein complexes. And we have some of those already. This is an effort that has been ongoing in, in, in Capri. For example, we have a score set, a Capri benchmark for scoring protein complexes, where you have a lot of decoy, we have a lot of incorrect models, and spiked with correct models. And you, you, know, you can use you know, these type of data sets to improve your predictions to see whether your predict prediction method is working correctly. And then we have a number of other really, really very useful structure-based benchmark for protein-protein binding affinities has been developed and uh, benchmark for testing grounds for integrating homology modeling and protein docking. But you know, we need probably need much more than that. So this is my you know my presentation. I hope I was not too long. I don't know. I haven't looked at it at, at the time. But uh, okay. So thanks to all all the people involved, especially Mark Lensing, who is on the call here and he will answer questions because he has been the main assessor together with me on all these uh, uh, all these evaluations. And uh, uh, Samir and Nurul have been running Capri from the EBI, and you know, I should have mentioned them way before, because without them, this could not have been possible. And Capri is a completely, on volunteer basis, enterprise. So thank you to all of these people. I'm done. Thank you very much, Shoshana. So on behalf of all the attendees, let me thank you indeed on this very nice history and overview uh, of Capri, as well as looking at the current challenges and proposing uh, some ways forward, uh, including tools um, and support that might be available by collaboration with BioXL. That's great. So I will just um, so encourage anybody who has any questions to use the facility uh in the go to webinar application i'll put up a slide just now uh, as a reminder visual reminder of where this lives uh how you can ask any questions of Joshana in the go to webinar yes i should add that uh, mark lansing is here in attendance and i will just unmute him now so um I, if he has any comments to make, um, we don't have any questions, I think. Let me check. No questions asked so far. So, Mark, if you have any comments to make at all about what Shoshana has already said, please feel free. And if anybody, meanwhile, would like to ask any questions uh, about Capri or anything else that Shoshana has presented, either her or from Mark, uh, do en um, enter your question in the questions uh, tool. I, I have no comments. It was a very nice presentation. Uh, I would just like to add that if people have questions later, that they are free to uh, contact us by any means. Thank you, Mark. No, no questions at all? <laughs> I don't see any questions, no. Okay. Don't see any questions. So, um, I mean, this is, this is a, it's a good chance to ask questions. <laughs> Any question doesn't really matter. Let's, yeah, let's uh, let's give people a minute to think. Okay. And was, I suppose was, go ahead. Was, uh, uh, was Alexander Bonvin on, on the call? Yes, I believe so. I see uh, Alexander on the list of attendees. So he is here. Okay. Alexander, do you have a comment? No? I have a question that Alexander has just uh, entered. Uh, ah. even, even before you said his name, I don't know. But anyway, I'll read it out for you. So okay. uh, I, uh, I, and then I will unmute Alexander as well, actually, because he might he might ask it himself. Um, yeah, if he, great. 
so he, his question is, have you seen examples of AI applied to docking already? Now I will, I will let you respond and I will also unmute Alexander so he can uh, enter the conversation. Yeah, Alexander? I was hoping that AI would come up, okay? <laughs> Hi there. Hello? Hi. So go ahead if you would like to uh, respond to that, Shoshana. Okay, so, so to protein, protein docking, no, not yet. Uh, I know that AI has been, has been used for small knowledge protein docking, and this has some controversial results. But the problem for you know protein protein docking is is really very different, I think, than from you know in some in some way different from from protein structure prediction, because you have all these different these conformational changes, and also that the same potentials that are being used you know the database derived potentials and the models that are being used for protein structure prediction may not be you know necessarily uh, valid for for interface predictions this is something we have seen many many years ago deriving these knowledge based potentials because ai is now the deep learning people have used basically the same idea that was developed many years ago to uh, to use you know known protein known structures to derive distance based potentials for interactions between residues and they are just you know doing very fancy you know smoothing of the functions and things like that you know to get the deep learning and they have a much bigger set of data so yeah the data sets you know also the the what, what i think is 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 hampering you know the prediction of protein complexes the ai application of protein complexes is the data set the small size of the data set of available complexes c and actually maybe not so small but the fact that you know we don't really know what the complex is usually <laughs> so we need to make sure that in the complexes we study on that we used as reference to derive the models are really biological complexes. I mean, that would, that would be my, my long answer. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. I have muted Alexander because uh, due to background noise, uh, he's not able to use his microphone to respond. But if, uh, if Alexander, you want to follow up with any further reply to that or response to that, you can do so in the, uh, the questions tool. Uh, just a reminder that um, uh, this webinar is, as it's recorded, it will be available to review uh, online in, in the near future uh, via the BioXL website and on our BioXL YouTube channel. It would be nice to know, you know, what the bio, if there are some BioXL participants or people from the community of BioXL, whether, you know, what, how they think they can help. Yes, so um, I'm sure that uh, uh, the prime, well, the, the obvious um, uh, member of the community of, of Capri, as you know, uh, who is also part of BioXL is Alexandre, <laughs> and <laughs> I'm sure you, you're in touch with him. Uh, I don't know if there are any other attendees um, who are, um, well, I know that of BioXL projects itself, it is myself and Alexandre, uh, and I'm in a slightly different area, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it would be great. I mean, we are really open. You know, I, I think yeah. I can I can I can speak for you know for the Capri community that we are really open to any any collaboration in this respect, especially you know for for these conformational changes and the modeling of, of of flexibility. I mean, I think this is really important. That's great. Yeah, great. We can follow up on that. Okay. <laughs> so there's a response. There's a response from uh, Alexandre with uh, with a link um, that I will email saying that uh, a relevant an example of a relevant BioXL use case or rather a sort of a demonstrator research project uh, in this area um, would be uh, an antibody design project um, that um, is linked um, is on the BioXL website indeed I will um, 
the link is visible in the questions panel. Uh, but Shoshana, I don't know if you can see it. If not, I will message no. send this to you later by email. And it's yeah, also okay. yeah, that the, could be. Yeah, I, yeah, I think so, we had, yeah, we so had a contact. Sorry, go ahead. If you or anybody else listening is interested indeed in what BioXL is doing in this area, then you should have a look at the BioXL website. Um, and under research and projects, there is a listing of the kind of projects in, that we are engaging in, including the one that Alexander just linked. Uh, that is antibody design through biomolecular interactions engineering. So that might be of interest to people in the Capri community as well as in the BioXL community that's interested in yeah. using. Yeah. For example, for example, HEDEC, um combination with Chromax and PMX, which are some of the focus applications of BioXL. Yeah. So the Great. idea there is that so the idea there is that in that in that in that demonstrator research projects, the idea is to use Chromax to improve the antibody 3D structures and then accurately sample multiple alternative conformations. Uh, and then the resulting conformations will be used as input in Haddock. To model interaction with its target antigen. Yeah, I mean this is exactly this is exactly what you know what 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 would be you know useful to do, but in a more general way. But I think why not to start with the you know antibody, especially nowadays you have nanobodies. <laughs> this is yeah. small enough to do all this kind of gymnastics. Yeah, and then apparently so then then the next step is at some point is that the models of these complexes will be optimized with MD using Chromax to select uh, a final model that can be for which the yeah. PMX can be used to improve the binding affinity. Yeah. yeah anyway, I mean, it's, not, it's not my area, but if anybody's interested, please do have a look at, uh, uh, at this okay. and get in touch with us and uh, we, can, we can discuss this. Alexander has responded further uh, saying that as BioXL, you would also be interested to push for more antibody antigen targets um, and to get interest from industry in this. Yeah, so this is something we have been discussing and uh, already with with Alexander. So I got in con, you know, I had, you know, he thanks to him, you know, we had some contacts with some fellows that will, you know, assemble structures on on antibodies, or actually not structures, but look look at the PDB to find out groups that actually work for un, work with antibodies and mm. you know, antibody complexes and try to have a nice list of these you know groups and be able to solicit targets from them and we actually have quite a bit of of targets you know at the VOB where I where I work because they are the world center for for nanobodies mm. they you know they turn in you know protein nanobody complexes all the time mm. so that could be could be of interest as well, although these are, you know, not really full full antibodies. But anyway, this is something we are looking into, and you know, I would be very happy if we get more targets, it's any nanobodies or anything else. <laughs> yeah. So I see um, one attendee has raised their hand that may mean that they are interested in speaking to ask a question rather okay. than entering questions. Saying, I will just try this. So that the attendee is Noel Karaskal. Uh, I will unmute you, Noel, and see if you want to ask a question. If I don't hear anything shortly, I will uh, mute you again, but go ahead. Okay, I'm not, uh, I'm not hearing Noel, so maybe it was an accidental. Oh, I can hear you now, yes. Oh, okay, sorry, uh, I'm doing it from my phone. So it's kind of odd. Anyway, you're a bit soft. Is, you're a bit soft. So please speak up. Okay. My question is: uh, Is this a purely geometrical kind of um, exercise, or do we have to infer um, nucleotide or 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 guanine uh, diphosphates or uh, ATPs that are attached to the protein or post-translational modifications? Are those uh, provided to the for the contest or uh, we have to sort of guess that they would be there. Okay, so for the, I mean, that's that's a fair question because this, you know, is a is a, a added complexity. But for the time being, you know, we we get actually we work on targets that are being offered by structural biologists. In other words, people who have already analyzed the structure of of a given complex. So whatever information is necessary to uh, uh, build the complex 
is more or less, you know, is, is communicated to the, to the predictors. So far, we didn't have cases where we, where there were PTMs, in other words, post-translational modifications, phosphorylations or anything else in the region that was important for, you know, in the interface region. In other words, region that was important for prediction, predicting the interface. Okay. So in general, so this was not a problem, okay? Yeah. Okay, so you will provide that information on the case by case basis. If if there is an information, say yes, okay, you know there is. But you see, if you say that that is a particular residue which has to be, you know, phosphorylated, and 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 then you know, and it's important for the prediction, you are already giving away uh, where the interface would be. So it depends. Okay. So so far okay. we didn't have this problem. Thank you. And it's not only geometric, it's really, you know, it's really building a model which is physically, chemically reasonable. I see. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you for your question. I will mute you again. So, um, if, if and nobody has any other questions, um, then it remains for me to say uh, to thank you again, Shoshana. Um, and I have on the final slide that is showing now, um, attendees can see uh, a bit more information about BioXL. So if you're interested, have a look at our website. Thank you very much again. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Good. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark, as well. You're welcome. Okay. That concludes this oh. seminar. Yes. Okay. Finished. Bye, how everyone. Do, how do I exit? Um,